Okay, uh, we can get going. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is David Duffy. I'm the CTO at Quanterix, and today I'll be describing Samoa and, in particular, the the uh, new benchtop instrument that we've launched, the SRX, and uh, how it can be used to detect uh, very sensitively proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, what I've done is I've put everybody on mute uh, to minimize background noise. So if you have any questions during the webinar, then please type them into the GoToMeeting uh, app, and uh, I'll try to uh, answer them as best I can at the end of the presentation. Everybody can see my, my screen. Um, just an update on, on how Samoa has been going. We've been out uh, on the market for a few years now and uh, been making what we think is a very big impact in the sensor detection of biomolecules. Uh, we have approaching 200 instruments uh, that are installed. That's now a combination of the HD1 and the SRX. Um, through our ability to offer people uh, homebrew assays and also our own internal menu development, we've uh, developed or customers have developed with us uh, over uh, 180 uh, biomarker assays. And this has all led to uh, a deluge of publications uh, rapidly growing, so we're up to 180 publications uh, using Samoa. <clears throat> and what all this is happening, all this re exciting research has led to a pretty big impact in, in clinical trials. So between Quanterix and uh, our CROs that offer Samoa services, over 500 clinical trials have been impacted by uh, the Samoa technology. So, so things are going along pretty nicely. And the reason is, is because uh, of sensitivity and, and Samoa's ability to, to see what was previously unseen. And for many years, we've been using an analogy of an iceberg uh, for protein detection, where uh, previously, uh, where the old detection limit was in the picogram per mil range, and just um, a few hundred proteins could be uh, detected above that uh, limit of detection, leading to about 200 FDA-approved diagnostic tests. Uh, when we did our calculations, we figured that there would be uh, many thousands of proteins that lie beneath the water level that could be detected if with another technology. And with Samoa's improvement in sensitivity, uh, roughly about a thousand-fold improvement in sensitivity, we've seen the benefits of that and many more different proteins that are being measured in bodily fluids. And we think that there's just an enormous potential for increasing the number of proteins that, that can be measured and the diagnostic information available to people, much in the same way that PCR revolutionized the detection of nucleic acids via sensitivity. So uh, based on this ability, we've been uh, developing uh, various products, their instruments, the assay kits that are run on those instruments and services. So on the far left, we have the Samoa HD1, which was our, our flagship product. It's uh, what we've been on the market with, with for a number of years. And uh, it offers the Samoa technology and in uh, completely integrated format. So it does samples to results. And this is the, the instrument that most of the publications have been based on. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is the, the SRX, which is our benchtop instrument. So what we've done is we... Um, taken the reader portion of the HD1 and uh, turned that into an instrument so it's a much smaller form factor, fits on a bench top, um, and it gives us a lot more flexibility on the upfront uh, assay preparation um, that we can do, which has really opened up a lot of possibilities for us and our customers, including nucleic acid uh, testing. Very important thing to point out is that it runs exactly the same kits that are run on the HD1 with exactly the same data quality. So uh, the numbers are the same, and you can port your assays between the two. In terms of assays, uh, we offer currently more than 80 different assays, uh, mostly in the area of neurology, uh, oncology, infectious diseases, and inflammation. And very importantly, we offer a homebrew kit, which enables people to develop their own assays uh, in both singleplex and multiplex formats. <clears throat> in terms of services, the Accelerator Lab has been a, a really big success for us. It's uh, often the way that people start with Samoa. Um, as we can develop new assays there, we can test samples uh, using our existing kits. We can do very large uh, clinical trials uh, for large numbers of samples. And uh, even our people who have instruments um, 
make use of the accelerator lab to develop new assays and to ship custom kits. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about the SRX mostly, um, but I'm going to try to cover some broader information as well. So I'm going to start just with a grounder in the Samoa technology for those of you that are not familiar. I'm going to give an update on some of the exciting new publications that have appeared based on Samoa. Then I'm getting into the meat of it, which is describing how the SRX works, um, the technology behind it, and how a user operates it, and then show you, show you the data that is being generated on the SRX. So how does Samoa work in the first place? Well, it's a pretty simple idea, uh, but very elegant in that what we've done is we've, we've digitized uh, the ELISA. So for those of you that are familiar with ELISA, uh, you usually start with a microtider plate uh, that you coat with um, an antibody. The sample's added and proteins from that sample are captured by the antibodies. And then you label them with a sandwich in a sandwich format using a secondary antibody and an enzyme. And you add a, a substrate to the enzyme. The enzyme turns over the substrate to produce a, a colored or a fluorescent product. Now the problem with ELISA is that those product molecules diffuse into the entire volume of the well, which is about 100 microliters. And that dilutes those molecules and makes them difficult to detect. So on a plate reader, what you'll find is that you'll need millions of enzymes producing trillions of fluorophores to reach the detection limit. So what we do with Samoa is instead of running the enzyme substrate reaction on all the molecules at once in one large volume, what we've done is we've isolated individual uh, enzyme labeled proteins in really small wells. So what we have is 239,000 wells that are four microns wide and three microns deep, so they have a volume of 50 uh, femtoliters, which is about two billion times smaller than an ELISA well. <clears throat> and then once we've got the molecules into those wells, the key step that we perform is that we seal up the wells with oil uh, in the presence of the enzyme substrate. So if you have uh, an enzyme trapped in one of these small wells, turning over its substrate, it produces about 3,000 fluorophores in um, 30 seconds, and that's trapped in 50 femtoliters, that's to be about micromolar concentration of fluorophore, which is really easy to see under a standard microscope, which is essentially what our detector is. So with Samoa, we've gone from needing millions of molecules to detect to needing a single molecule to detect, and that's the underlying basis of the sensitivity of the, of the technology. So the way that we do um, immunoassays and also nucleic acid assays now with this is we use paramagnetic beads coated in the antibodies of the proteins that you want to detect. So we add these beads to the samples and the beads are incredibly efficient at sucking all the proteins out of solution. And then we label them with the enzyme, the secondary antibody, put them in the well, seal them up and read the single molecules. And we described this approach in Nature Biotech uh, in 2010. And the core assay hasn't changed very much in, in those years still pretty much the same. Uh, some of the instrumentation around it obviously has changed quite a bit, and I'll talk about that. But what we do is we start with a sample, and what we have in this picture is blood. And um, indeed, a lot of the work that uh, has been done with Samoa is using serum and plasma and detecting biomarkers in that sample. But the way that I characterize it is that any, if you can get your molecules into a liquid form that is free of particulates, then we can do single molecule detection on them. So very common samples are cell lysate, cell supernatants, CSF, uh, environmental samples like river water, uh, stool we've even done where we've diluted it out and then filtered out the, the solid uh, matter. Um, really anything where, where you have a liquid, as I said. And what we do is we take that liquid form, so let's say serum, and we add it to a tube. And that can be a standalone cuvette or now with SRX, it's a microtider plate. And um, we'll take the, uh, usually about 25 microliters of that sample and we'll dilute it up to 100 microliters or so using a buffer. And that, what that buffer does is it improves recovery, it can lyse the uh, exosomes or, or however your sample is, is, your protein or nucleic acid is, is trapped, releasing them. And then we add the beads. So we add usually about 500,000 beads. Um, each one coated in the antibody of the protein that you want to detect. And to give you a reference, at femtomolar concentrations, which is where Samoa sits, there's about 60,000 molecules in 100 microliters. 
so you, what you've got here is a pass on distribution um, kind of situation where you have more beads than molecules and those molecules distribute over those beads. So you can imagine with a ratio of about 10 to 1, you're going to have 90% or so of the beads are going to have nothing on them. Uh, about 9.9% 9 .9 of the beads are going to have a single molecule as shown in this cartoon. And then you're going to have a very small fraction of beads that maybe have twos and threes. And there's a, the Poisson distribution equation will take that ratio of molecules to beads and give you the fraction of each of those situations. Then once you've captured those proteins, we label them with a detection antibody that's got a biotin on it, and then label that with streptavidin beta galactosidase, which is our enzyme conjugate. So now you've got a population of beads with the immunocomplexes on them, individual immunocomplexes, and I should say that there's a lot of platforms out there that use these similar beads, Luminex, Dubes, uh, Roche, Siemens, and, and Abbott all use very similar beads to uh, Quanterix. But with our single molecule sensitivity, we're able to read one molecule on a bead, whereas those analog methods usually require hundreds or thousands of, of analog molecules per bead to, to be detected. So once we have these beads, and this is either done on the instrument with HD1 or on our washer and manually using the SRX, we resuspend those beads in, in enzyme substrate, and then they get loaded onto the Samoa disk, and that's shown in the top right here. It's a uh, disk made by Blu-ray replication, and around the edge we have 24 different arrays. Each one has the 239,000 wells within it. There's a little inlet port that the beads get injected into, and there's an outlet port where vacuum is used to suck the beads into the, into the channel. The beads go into the channel, and they literally just fall into the wells via gravity. And then we put, uh, play our trick, or the instrument does, and it injects the oil into the same inlet port and it pushes the beads off the surface that don't make it into the wells, and then forms a liquid tight seal around the uh, wells containing the beads and the substrate. And then we start taking pictures with our microscope, essentially, and what we do is we uh, take pictures to identify where the beads are, because some of the wells don't have beads, and we take pictures to identify the turnover of the substrate, so that's where the roof in. We take two pictures separated by 30 seconds or so, so we only see an increase that's caused by uh, enzyme activity, and we can subtract, subtract out any background fluorescence, and this really helps with our signal uh, to, to noise ratio. What we do at the end of all that is we determine the fraction of beads detected that have an enzyme associated with them. So in this cartoon, we have six beads. Two of them have a single enzyme on them. So we have two divided by six, or 0.33. We call that fraction of on or F on in Nature Biotech. <clears throat> so you might ask, how do we know if there's a bead in the well? Well, what we do is we uh, use fluorescence as well in those uh, that case. So we have uh, four different fluorescence channels that are uh, devoted to um, identifying the beads and the way we use this to multiplex. So what we've done is we've uh, taken those four different channels and we've got four different dyes that we can attach to those beads and We've created 10 different codes uh, that we've launched commercially. We've worked on a, a 35 plex, uh, but the bottom line is that for each of those codes, we can attach a particular antibody uh, to those beads, and they're very specific, and we mix all those different subpopulations together and say a six plex, six different proteins. They go and grab the protein of interest. Um, we then incubate that with a mixture of detection antibodies with biotin on them. They then form specific sandwiches on each of those beads. We then label them with a generic enzyme conjugate and then load seal an image in exactly the way that I described in the, the last slide. So by being able to identify which, by fluorescence which bead in, is in each well, we're able to determine an F on for each of those different uh, bead types, and that's how we've been able to, to multiplex. We described this uh, four years ago in Lab on a Chip. So if you've got to know about Samoa, then you're probably aware of what AEB is. Uh, AEB is average number of enzymes per bead. This is a fundamental parameter in the Poisson distribution equation. It's the ratio of molecules to beads in our case. A simple way to look at this is if imagine if you have 10 beads, but you're at a very low concentration where you only get one molecule captured for those 10 beads, then your AEB is 0.1, 1 divided by 10. In this case, uh, if you could see the arrays, you'd see that the arrays look like the stars at night where there aren't that many beads lighting up. 
only about one in ten, and they're quite dim because there's only single enzymes uh, on those genes. As you go higher in concentration, to so say where you have six molecules distributed over ten beads, then what the Prasson distribution equation will tell us is that probably 40% of those beads will have no molecules on them. So I'm getting some background noise here. 40% uh, of those beads will have no molecules on them. Those beads that do will most likely have a single molecule on them, but there are a significant fraction now of beads that have uh, multiple molecules on them. For example, this bead that has two. Fortunately, we don't need to distinguish between ones, twos, and threes. Uh, the Prasson distribution equation will convert F on into A, B for us, so we're still in the digital world. As we go even higher in concentration to the point where we have, um, I'm going to stop for one moment and put everybody on mute again. Thanks, everybody. So now, if we at an even higher concentration, what we have is more molecules and beads, say where we have three times the number of molecules and beads where AB is three, we can't do digital counting anymore. So what we do is we average the intensity of all of the beads, divide that by what is produced by a single enzyme, and that also equals AB. So that's how we get a very broad dynamic range, and that's shown here. What we did here, we've got biotinylated beads, and we titrated down streptavidin beta galactosidase from picomolar concentrations down to zeptomolar concentrations, and our limit of detection was about 10 enzymes in 100 microliters or 220 zeptomolar. And this range here is the digital range, which is given by this equation that comes out of the Prasson distribution equation. And then once F on gets above 0.7, then the software switches and starts to use intensity ratios, and we get uh, the extension into the analog range. And we're working on ways of extending the dynamic range in both directions. But right now, we have about four to five logs of dynamic range in protein assays where there's actually a background in the assay uh, at about uh, between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 AB that cuts into dynamic range. But we still get a pretty good range of concentrations that can be measured. So the first assay that we uh, really ever did with Samoa was uh, prostate-specific antigen. And the reason was is because this is a marker for cancer. And it's in very high abundance in healthy individuals and also people with cancer. But a treatment for, for prostate cancer is to remove the prostate where the essentially the source of the biomarker is removed from the body. So what happens is that the concentrations drop below in blood, drop below the analytical sensitivity of the current hospital test, which is shown by the, by the green line. So the red dots are, are healthy people um, and their PSA levels. You can see they're well above the sensitivity. Now with Samoa, because of our single molecule sensitivity and our ability to lower backgrounds in our assays essentially, we're able to uh, have an assay that was more than a thousand times sensitive than the current hospital test and about a thousand times more sensitive than the most ultra sensitive PSA that was out there, which is at about 10 picograms per mil. And that's given by the red line here. So what we did, what we managed to do was get hold of 30 patients who'd had a radical prostatectomy and were all beneath the water level, all undetectable. And what we found was that we were able to measure PSA in all of these patients, even this gentleman down here at 14 femtograms per mil we could measure. And the remarkable thing was that there was about a thousand fold variation in the concentration of PSA in these patients. So rather than being told that you're undetectable, we were able now to ascribe a, a PSA number to each of these patients and where your PSA is after a surgery does seem to determine whether your cancer is going to recur. And we did a small clinical study uh, to demonstrate that, and there's continued work going on there. But this is our first example, but it, it really showed the benefit of being able to look beneath the water level. And I would say for each of those 185 biomarker tests that we've developed and our customers developed since then, in almost all cases, you really get a lot of insight just by being able to see uh, markers in different bodily fluids uh, uh, at these higher sensitivities. So as I said, 185 assays, this just shows you kind of a, a snapshot of those assays. Um, the, in fact, the first 15 or so that we launched and the kind of sensitivity improvements that we're able to achieve. So the, the green bars are the leading ELISAs that you can get out there, the leading vendor, uh, and the red bars are the LODs of, of the Samoa assays. 
<coughs> and as you can see, we're usually three or four logs uh, to the left of the green bars, and this is the, the thousand fold on average improvement sensitivity that we've seen. The orange, uh, so the yellow bars are the physiological concentrations in those samples. So you can see that with uh, the analog technologies for these proteins, you wouldn't have been able to detect in serum. And with Samoa, you're able to detect and also have enough buffer to have high sensitivity, uh, sorry, high precision, and also the ability to dilute samples. Some proteins, though, that we've, we've been looking at, we're pretty much at the limit of Samoa as it is today. For, inter, in, for example, interferon alpha is in the single digit femtogram per mil. So we're able to just, just about detect uh, all, all healthy individuals. And we're working on methods to reduce, take this, these red bars to even further to the left because we still have four or five logs left in Samoa sensitivity that we're going to be working on in the future. So what do you do with all this sensitivity? That was kind of what the question was for Quanterix in the early days. And um, as I said, there's over 170 publications now kind of explaining what it's useful for. These are the areas that really emerged. The, the first is, is, is infectious diseases. This is probably the easiest to understand because the earlier you can detect a virus or bacterium in a human, then the earlier you can treat. Um, obviously, PCR and detection of nucleic acids is kind of the gold standard there. Um, but those assays tend to be uh, quite difficult to, to perform, quite expensive. And also, the presence of the gene doesn't actually tell you that the, the bacteria or virus is, is replicating, causing disease, and we've uh, done a demonstration using C. difficile to show that the high rate of false positives in gene tests uh, is largely because they're not replicating, but with the uh, toxin test using Samoa, we're able to be much more specific about the, that infection. Probably the biggest area for Quanterix and Samoa has been in uh, neurology, and the big play there is that we're able to actually measure neurological markers in blood. So there are no blood tests for uh, neurological disorders today. If you need to be have an MRI or to uh, have a spinal tap and measure biomarkers in CSF, neither of which is, is a very pleasant experience or very cost effective. There was a real need to start measuring these uh, molecules in a simple blood test. The reason why it wasn't working before was because the blood-brain barrier forms a pretty tight seal in, around the CNS, stopping these markers to, from leaking into the periphery. Some do, some do diffuse across. And with Samoa sensitivity, we've been able to actually measure those molecules. And I'll give one example. And the remarkable thing is we've been able to correlate those concentrations to neurological outcomes. <clears throat> Oncology I've already touched on. Obviously, the earlier you can detect uh, markers for cancer, the more chance you have of treating those patients. And in the case of recurrence, uh, where after treatment, biomarker levels drop very low, but you don't really know if your cancer has been cured, Samoa can detect them right away and see if um, the treatment has been successful. Big area for us has been cytokines and, and chemokines, and these molecules that impact not just chronically inflammatory diseases, but also amino oncology uh, and many other areas. And the remarkable thing was that for most of these cytokines, they were not be it, or we could not quantitate those with analog methods. Um, so companies were developing a lot of drugs that targeted the cytokines, um, but they were not able to measure them in blood and show that their target, their drug was was hitting the target in uh, clinical trials. But using Samoa, you can measure these molecules and see uh, changes before and after treatment. Cardiovascular disease, uh, there's uh, a molecule troponin, which is a, a really very specific molecule for cardiac damage. But at the, with current tests, you can only actually measure it using um, uh, in people who are having a cardiac event. But with Samoa, we can measure troponin in all healthy people. So it may become the cholesterol of, of cardiac disease um, where we can measure and monitor troponin over time as people convert from uh, healthy into uh, cardiac disease. So I'm not gonna have much time to go over 180 publications worth. I just wanna kind of highlight uh, a couple um, of, of papers that uh, I think of a particular interest. This is one that we put out a, a couple of years ago um, where we were looking at um, a sixplex 
uh, for six different cytokines, uh, IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, and four other uh, cytokines. And we're able to measure these molecules in a single assay, single six-plex, um, before and after treatment with three different anti-TNF drugs. And we're able to show that TNF-alpha levels dropped um, after treatment. These are the white bars are before treatment and the uh, black bars are after treatment. And you can see that the levels that we're measuring are picograms per mil. So you really need femtogram per mil sensitivity with high precision to see these kind of single digit uh, picogram per mil changes. And we didn't just see that in uh, with, with TNF-alpha, we also saw it with, with IL-6. We started to use this assay to look at uh, the blood of diabetics, and we saw probably more inflammation in the blood of diabetics than we did in the blood of Crohn's disease patients. And what we're going to be launching um, in the next month or so is a sixplex that is uh, contains some of these proteins, but is really targeted at the immuno-oncology space, where you're also looking at interferon gamma and IL-17A, and I'll show some data on that. <clears throat> this was a paper that came out last year uh, on this topic, in fact, uh, that was done by Tufts University. And this was pretty intriguing, I thought. What they were looking at were uh, uh, many different uh, cytokines that were, were generated using Samoa, uh, using a combination of single-plex assay and also multiplex assays. And they were asking the question, what kind of variability do you get within a person? But then what kind of variability do you get within a population? And um, I guess the interesting thing was that the the variation within a person was actually pretty tight. Um, so that, that's the black bars. But the variation within a population was very much dependent on um, the cytokine. So something like IL-8 had a very large variation within the population. But something like TNF-alpha and IL-15 were much more tightly controlled within a population. So this really shows that with these new sensitive technologies, you really need to be getting baselines on individuals and monitoring these uh, over over time because not everybody has the same uh, concentration and depending on their their state at that particular time, their cytokines are going to be uh, varying quite a bit. The next paper is uh, a use of our P24 assay, which we found intriguing. We didn't really know what our P24 assay was going to be good for. We were looking at seroconversion, an early detection of this. But what pharmaceutical companies are doing is using it to uh, look for and treat latent HIV. So right now there isn't a cure for HIV uh, because the virus uh, kind of hides in the body and uh, researchers and clinicians basically don't know if the person has been completely cleared of the virus. So there are treatments being developed where uh, companies uh, administer a drug to kind of get the virus out of hiding to make it start to replicate and then hit it with a, a second drug to completely eliminate it. The challenge that they've had in doing this is, is that because the virus is at such low levels um, and the gene is at such low levels, it's been very hard to detect and to make these measurements. And they were unsuccessful using gene tests because the, the variation in the HIV uh, genome is so great now, um, PCR tests just couldn't detect. So they started to use our P24 assay, which is every virus produces basically the same form of P24. And so they were using this to uh, look at T cells um, before and after treatment with uh, their kind of knockup uh, treatment. And they could, see, they could uh, show that they could increase the production of P24 so the, virus, or the, the viral genome starts replicating again, and then show that they could knock it back down with, with the secondary treatment. Again, this has enabled uh, a new, you know, new drugs to be to be developed. Something that couldn't be done with the existing either protein assays or with the genetic tests. The next uh, paper is really uh, one looking at the analytical performance of of Samoa and how does it compare to other technologies that are out there. So this was done by the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. So this was four or five leading pharma companies, uh, all of whom owned an HD1. And they said, look, let's run the same assay over our different sites. Let's run the same samples and let's see what kind of variability that we get. Uh, it's a pretty nice paper. And they also did a comparison with um, a competing technology based on electrochemiluminescence, uh, looking at the detection of, uh, of an antibody drug. 
So what they found was that there was a really nice uh, stability of IL-6 in terms of the calibration curve. Um, we've been working hard at trying to make um, the AB values as consistent from, from lab to lab. Uh, because essentially what you're doing is measuring the number of molecules in the sample. So in theory, um, we should be able to get good good uh, repeatability. Uh, same thing for samples. They're able to get good re re reproducibility. I think there was one sample that, where they didn't get good uh, dilution linearity from, from site to site, and they're trying to understand what, what could be happening specifically with that sample. But it is seen that Samoa is very precise and reproducible across labs. And then with the uh, comparison, when they were interested in measuring antibody drugs, and they were able to, using ECL or using Samoa, and they showed that they could get a 40-fold improvement using single molecule detection, and this enabled them to uh, measure this molecule in their samples. So uh, pretty interesting comparison, third party, um, by these different pharma companies. The final story to share is uh, NFL. It's a pretty uh, exciting molecule, and it's been uh, spearheaded by Jens Kula and also uh, Blenau and Zetterberg in, in Europe. And um, they really believed that this molecule, neurofilament light, would be a very specific marker of, of neurological uh, disorders, but they didn't have assays that were sensitive enough to measure in blood. They were using ELISA and electrochemiluminescence again, uh, doing a homebrew assay, and they were getting LODs. Um, in the, picogram, in the high picogram per mil range. And then when they were looking in serum, uh, they were getting a pretty high proportion of, you can see 50% and 60% of patients were, were undetectable. So this was a real hindrance for them. So they developed their own uh, NFL assay using our homebrew kit and they got sub picogram per mil sensitivity and that enabled them to measure all patients. So there were no undetectable. We've since launched uh, an NFL kit based on the same antibodies. I think we've squeezed out quite a bit more sensitivity uh, to get us into the um, femtogram per mil range. And this is now commercially available. And as a result of this kind of uh, homebrew work by those groups and then our, our ability to then uh, turn that into a commercial kit, there's been a, a flood of publications on, on NFL. And it's emerging as uh, an incredibly specific marker uh, for a number of uh, uh, diseases. This was uh, one publication that came out uh, on ALS um, at our PPH meeting uh, last year. Nancy Freites, who started the Ice Bucket Challenge, kind of got up and, and implored researchers to, to develop tests for, for ALS and treatments for ALS. And... Um, I don't think at that time we really had anything, but then this paper came out soon after where people, uh, these researchers were looking at neurofilament light and also neurofilament heavy, uh, and were able to show and improve uh, pretty good uh, diagnostic capability for looking at uh, using NFL to, to diagnose ALS uh, very early on compared to other uh, very similar diseases. And this is just one example, but it, it, it does show the the benefits of Samoa and it all I do want to emphasize that it all kind of came from from our ability to offer homebrew it was uh, the Zetterberg group and Kula that, that did this themselves so we sell the beads and we teach people how to attach antibodies to them they mix them with the samples to ca capture the proteins we teach them how to biotinate their antibody and provide them with the enzyme conjugate and they can develop all their own assays uh, pretty simply so now moving on to the uh, main topic today, which is the SRX. This is a picture of the instrument. Um, for those of you uh, that are familiar with HD1, I thought it would be useful to kind of show what we've done with the SRX and, and how we've been able to maintain the same kind of performance in HD1 uh, using the SRX. So the HD1 is a, a stand alone instrument, a floor standing unit, and it contains all of that you need to to run an immunoassay. <clears throat> so the reagent bay and the fixed tip pipetta, which does all the reagent handling, what we've done with the SRX is we've replaced that with a human and an eight channel pipette. The incubation ring and mixing of the beads with the sample, we've replaced that with a shaker. So we have a Samoa shaker 
and essentially it uh, allows us to resuspend the bees in, in sample or reagent very reproducibly with temperature control. <clears throat> the wash part where we've got to pellet the beads, remove supernatant and wash the beads to make sure we get very low background, we've replaced the wash ring in the HD1 with the Samoa uh, washer. So what this does is it takes a 96 wall plate, we have a 96 uh, magnet array underneath and those beads get pelleted and they go into the washer and the, um, there are needles that aspirate out the sample and then dispense 96 uh, wash buffer solutions. And this does it very repeatedly, very quickly. And then the kind of brain of the instrument, which is the, uh, what we call the LSI, the load seal and image, that's now what the SRX is. So the SRX takes those 96 wall plates with the, the beads containing the immunocomplex and it uh, one at a time uh, loads those beads into the disc, seals them up and image them and does um, all the single molecule counting. So we've uh, put quite a lot of effort into to making sure this can all be done very robustly. Um, one of the reasons the HD1 was a sample to results um, instrument was because we really wanted to make sure that user uh, variability was, was minimized and uh, in the intervening years we've, we've come up with ways to uh, make the manual workflow as robust as a fully automated instrument <clears throat> and I'll describe that in a little bit. So the workflow is pretty simple what someone starts with a 96 volt plate into which they uh, pipetted their samples they then use a multi-channel pipette to dispense the beads they then put on the shaker, so now you're capturing your proteins uh, and the beads are being nicely resuspended in solution. The incubations uh, are usually about um, at least 10 minutes, um, sometimes 15 minutes. Once the incubation is done, it's put on the magnet, the beads are pelleted and then put into the washer, aspirated, the beads are washed and um, come out dry, comes out to the user, they then add the dissection antibody with uh, the same multi-channel pipette, goes through the same process, shaken and incubated, uh, shorter incubation times for reagents, washed again, add your enzyme, shake, wash, and then put on the instrument. And we have two-step and one-step assays where this can be compressed. So the typical work uh, flow is, the average is about one hour for this part, for the incubation. We do have some longer assays, which take two hours. And this is the bulk of the hands-on time, it's about 30 minutes hands-on time. So it's put on the instrument and I'll talk about this and then that, that's a two hour read for the 96 well plate and there's about a five minute hands on time for the instrument. So in terms of uh, using the instrument, uh, we've tried to make this as easy as possible. So we've got a very simple software where the user uh, essentially has to identify what resources to put on. So there's, do you have enough discs? Do you have a plate? Do you have the substrate, the tips? And the sealing oil and is the waste bin empty and if you have a green check then you're good and if you have a red triangle then you need to put tips on so you press that button and the carousel on the instrument will will open up and you put tips on um, if you need reagent you press on that button and it'll come around and you put the reagent on you will then define on the screen uh, what assays you're running which multiplex it is uh, whether you've got samples and calibrators on that screen and then as long as you've loaded all those resources and emptied your waste uh, bin, then you press go and then it off, off it goes to, to do the analysis. So what's happening inside the instrument when this is all happening, uh, probably good to, to explain that a little bit. Um, what uh, the instrument does, it has a, uh, a pipetta, it picks up a tip, it goes to the 96, well, uh, sorry, it goes, picks up some uh, enzyme substrate from the bottle, it re goes to one of the wells, resuspends the beads, uh, loads them onto the disc. Uh, they, the beads get pulled onto the disc, sealed, loaded and sealed, and then imaged. And the instrument simply goes through um, each of those 96 wells, repeating that process, and that takes about the two hours. And we've uh, taken a lot of care to make sure that the signal in well one is exactly as the same as the signal um, in well 96. In fact, what we found is uh, we've come up with a way where uh, after the plate leaves the washer, it can be stored overnight more and probably for more extended periods uh, before it has to be put onto the, <clears throat> to the reader. We stabilize the immunocomplex on the beads. 
So that uh, is what gives us the very stable signals. So that's how it all works. Uh, this is the data that we've been producing on the instrument. So these are just some of the very first cow curves that we were producing from our pilot production of instruments uh, and our washer. So we gave them names. Um, this one was called Curly. Uh, this is Pilot 7, and we were looking at IL-17A, and these are the uh, kind of CVs that we, we can uh, generate, uh, sub-10% CVs, as we expect from the, from the HD1. This was with a 30-minute incubation and uh, sample incubation and two 10-minute incubations, and we're able to maintain the high LOD, sensitive LOD and, and LOQ of the, um, of the HD1. We looked at our P24 assay. I mentioned that already. That's a very important assay for some of our researchers. This one has a, a longer incubation time, uh, 45 minutes, so it's a bit of a longer assay, but again, uh, sub 10% uh, CVs. Uh, we put our uh, fourplex on the instrument. So this is our neuro fourplex. Uh, so this is just one set of uh, experiments. This is the data for, for GFAP, uh, for TAU, for UCLH1 and for neurofilament light, they're a very important molecule. So from one experiment, you get the concentrations for all of these different uh, different assays, and we're working through our full menu of 80, but the, um, the correspondence between the two platforms is very good. As I mentioned, we're just measuring the, the ratio of molecules to, to beads by simply tuning the temperature of the incubation um, and also uh, concentration of the SPG. In some cases, we're able to get exactly the same cal curves, and that's what we've been launching. <clears throat> so it's very important to know that the concentration measures in the two platforms are exactly the same, and that's what this data shows. There's a really good correlation between the two. That isn't always true of competing technologies that you may have heard, where some of the newer instruments, they give different numbers from the previous instruments based on their technology, but with Samoa, and the ratio method, um, we're able to do that. LODs and LOQs have been maintained. Sometimes they're higher, a little bit higher than LO, uh, HD1. Sometimes they're a bit, a little bit lower, just depending on the particular experiments that we're running, I think. But overall, the, you get the same kind of performance from the two platforms. Precision, obviously, very important to us. So we've been looking at uh, within-run precision and between-run precision uh, for AB and we're able to maintain those sub 10% uh, CVs um, using this manual process. So that's a really, I think a key point is that other technologies have had a challenge for doing a manual process. But with Samo, we put a lot of thought into how do you make this robust to different users? So we really wanted it to be just like an ELISA, almost to the point where you wouldn't even know that there were beads in this assay. So by the use of a, a multi-channel pipette, a shaker, and a washer, we've been able to get excellent user-to-user -user data. So our field application scientists come in, and in one day they're trained and getting great data. Our experience um, in the field with our first 20 or so instruments that have been installed, uh, users have been getting uh, very good precision as well. So the, uh, the kind of chemical basis uh, of that precision that I talked about earlier is translating into to good robust data. This is uh, just showing some data on our multiplexes. I think people are always very interested in multiplexes, our fourplex, the data from our validation package. Uh, you can see the calibration curves that you get for the different proteins. And then when we're looking at uh, readings in, in, we were looking at serum and plasma and CSS, because that's what people are using these assays for, we're able to get uh, some nice uh, data that corresponds to uh, the HD1. These are the specifications of the uh, fourplex. I don't want to get into to this in too much detail, but we're able to maintain the, the very tight CVs and the good di dilutional linearity uh, for SRX as we had for HD1. <clears throat> I mentioned our sixplex. This is still um, kind of going through the the um, launch process with the sixplex, but it's looking very good across our SRX in, is internally. Again, showing you the calibration curves, um, just so you can see what the proteins are, the TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-17A, interferon gamma, and IL-10 and IL-12. And for those of you in this space will know that these are important molecules in, in the immuno-oncology field, which is where we're targeting this for. 
And here we've just been looking at plasma and serum, although we have been doing some CSF testing as well and able to, to get a good, good readability uh, using the sixplex. So we're excited to get this into the hands of people soon. And now I'm going to finish just um, kind of one more thing. I've talked really almost exclusively about proteins um, so far, and that's really where Samoa has cut its teeth and what it's become known for. But we've, we've long felt that we could use Samoa to help people detect nucleic acids. And uh, we've had a few publications over the years. We had a paper in 2013 in analytical chemistry where we showed equivalent sensitivities of PCR for bacterial uh, detection. But the pieces never really fell in place to make it compelling, but SRX is definitely a big piece of the jigsaw that we think is, is coming together now. With the HD1, um, because it was fully automated, for proteins, it was always a bit of a challenge to get nucleic acid assays to work because of the different temperatures needed, the different buffers, incubation times, and so on. It wasn't really a, a, gen, a general platform. But with the SRX, by our ability to do sample prep offline, we've got a lot more flexibility on, on the assay and has enabled us to do nucleic acids. So there's a couple of options. So I don't want to confuse people, but there are actually two assays here. One was reported by Tufts University um, last uh, summer, and they were using lock nucleic acids uh, to detect three different microRNAs. They developed a three-plex for these three uh, oncology markers that are microRNA, and they got sensitivities that were equivalent to, to PCR. And uh, we since reproduced this assay internally, and it's, uh, it's a very sensitive and very specific assay. And uh, so that's definitely an option. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about now, though, is an assay that we've been working with Destina Genomics and with the University of Edinburgh, where we've been looking at microRNA 122. This is a marker for um, liver toxicity, liver damage. So we're able to show with an assay where we're purifying the, the RNA from samples that we got really good distinction between patients with drug-induced liver injury and healthy volunteers using this assay. So it's a good example of how you can use homebrew to implement uh, use Samoa. So Destina have this really elegant chemistry where they have uh, PNA probes, peptide nucleic acid probes, and they attach these, a single probe to a bead. And then if the exact target binds with the exact same match, then this cytosine covalently attaches itself to the probe and labels the bead with a biotin, which we can then label with our enzyme and count single molecules. So it's a single probe approach with very short probes and single base specificity. It's um, very elegant. It didn't quite have the sensitivity of PCR, but it was good enough definitely for measuring microRNA 122. So that was also last summer. And what we've been working with Destina since is our holy grail, which is can you detect nucleic acids without having to purify them from the sample? So this is probably the biggest challenge of PCR is to extract those nucleic acids and detect them, and people would much rather just detect in samples. So we've developed a workflow with Destina where there is no purification, and it looks a lot like our immunoassays. In fact, we use the same washer, the same shaker, um, the same multi-channel pipette. It's the same stuff. So what we do is we uh, add our serum and plasma uh, to the well of a 96-well plate, and then to add to that, we add in Destina's uh, lysis buffer and PNA uh, labeled uh, beads. Uh, the beads basically hybridize at 25 degrees C for an hour to capture the microRNA that's in, in the sample. We then separate on the washer that I showed uh, with a magnet and then wash them. And then we uh, add the Destina smart base and reducing agent to couple the biotin to the beads. Again, uh, separate the beads, wash them. Then we label them with SBG separate and wash, so it's exactly the same as um, the uh, protein assays. And then we put them on the uh, SRX reader and uh, read them and get AB values. So that whole process takes about four hours for this. It's a bit longer than the protein assays because of the, the longer hybridization time, but essentially the same workflow. And in fact, Destina just got delivery of their SRX yesterday and they're running it today. Um, and they're gonna be doing a, a clinical studies using their, their chemistry. 
This is the data we got with the assay with Destina in December at Quanterix. And this is with the direct detection. So unlike the PLOS One paper that we had out where we purified it, this is um, with the direct detection. So we managed to get some samples from a pharmaceutical company that were very kind enough to let us uh, show the data in this webinar. Uh, there were two cohorts of rats. One had uh, no treatment with a, a drug, and the other set of rats had a treatment with a drug at different levels. Uh, we haven't yet unblinded these data, uh, they're still doing their reports, but I think you can see which set of rats were the control group and which set of rats received the, the, uh, the drug. And from what we've been told is that there's a direct correlation between the level of microRNA 122 in the rat plasma, uh, as you'd expect from the dosing of these rats and, and also the, the preclinical measurements on those rats. <clears throat> so this is all done with two microliters of rat plasma and we also repeated it at 10 microliters, and we got a slightly better separation for this rat, who was quite close to the limit of detection, but it seemed to work very well. The data on the right is looking at humans and, and human serums. So James Deere from University of Edinburgh, our collaborator there, he was very kind enough to send us the serum of someone who had drug-induced liver injury pretty severely. And we kind of did a comparison of our PLOS1 assay, which was a purified RNA, and direct detection. And the great thing was, which what we expected was we, we got a much bigger signal with direct detection, about a five-fold improvement in sensitivity using direct detection. So we're not, we found that purifying out the RNA, we, we get losses, we, the molecule breaks down, it makes it harder to detect. And endogenous samples, we have much greater success and reproducibility uh, from the direct detection method. This was done using 10 microliters of sample and what Destina and James are now going to be doing is testing about 1,200 different patients that they've collected over the years where they've been able to show that micro 122 is a very specific um, marker of drug-induced liver injury and now move this from a PCR assay, which they found to be quite variable, um, into a very simple microtider plate assay that can be done um, with good reproducibility. So that's... Uh, what I wanted to cover, I just want to kind of sum up. And um, so now we have two instruments, uh, whereas before we had one. Uh, one uh, is the HD1 um, standalone, and then with the SRX, we call it the system, which is a combination of the reader, the washer, and the shaker. Both offer the ultra sensitive detection. One's a bench top, one's a floor standing. One uses semi automated. Uh, technology but with good reproducibility and one is completely automated and both have access um, to the 80 or so kits that we have and also both can be used to do homebrew so depending on what your research is uh, based on wh whether you need the flexibility um, of the SRX or you really just want to analyze a lot of samples you you know depending on what you want to do then we now have two options for you so with that, I'll just thank you for, for your attention, and um, if you do have any questions, then please reach out to me. My email address is there, or to uh, your contact at Quanterix, or visit our website. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. I'm recording this webinar, so you can listen to it afterwards as well, and uh, I'll see if there are any questions um, that have arisen. And uh, now will be a good time to start typing if you have any questions. So uh, I don't have any questions. Um, I hope that's because I answered everything completely in the um, in the webinar. Um, but if you do have any questions subsequently, as I said, just reach out to us and we'll um, try to answer them as best we can. And hope we can get you involved with the SRX or HD1 or the accelerator. So thanks everybody, and I wish everybody a good day. And I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye.